Thursday Night Football onto my second favorite team, according to Sims. Although this year it's more fun to watch Steelers games than Vikings games, in my opinion. Thursday night you get to watch the Steelers, eight and two, at the Browns, two and eight. Thursday Night Football, Amazon Prime, and I know people are going to be like, uh, but you never know what the Browns are going to do. It's a division rivalry. It, it, what else do the Browns have to play for at this point? So. And we're getting to the point in the season where the standalone weeknight big tent pole games, there aren't many left in the season. So we better enjoy them while we have them. There's going to be some good ones like Ravens Chargers Monday night, and there's going to be some that aren't as good, but it's still football on TV on a weeknight. So let's enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things. You got to look in, in, inside this game and, and look at some individual matchups or individual players and see, okay, what's going to happen with this? Uh, you look at the my, which which defensive end is better, Miles Garrett or T.J. Watt, and they had a, a back and forth about defensive player of the year. Uh, you look at, at what Russell Wilson can do against the Browns. You're still waiting for the Steelers to have one of those breakout offensive explosion type of games. May not happen against the Browns because even though they're two and eight defense. Is not terrible, but it's more of a test. As you as you know, the Steelers are going to make the playoffs, but how will they be able to function in the playoffs? And you want to see them take on a bad team and kind of pad some stats, uh, for lack of a better phrase, just get that done. And for Cleveland, uh, I mean, there's really there's really nothing to look forward to, Mike. You know, Deshaun Watson out for the season, Jameis Winston up and down. Uh, Nick Chubb was a good comeback story, but it, this is what a what a disastrous season. We've seen some other ones, so we haven't really paid attention to Cleveland because things like the Jets keep doing things that that take our focus elsewhere. But if not for the Jets, imagine what we'd be saying about the the Cleveland Browns. Uh, just what a, an awful mess based on what we expected to see from Cleveland and what's actually happening, uh, this is, it, it's shocking, really. And we haven't focused on the shock because there have been some other bad franchises in football uh, like the Jaguars and Jets. And, you know, that's a great point. Now, the similarities are ownership in all of those locations. Bad ownership dragging down the team. Bad ownership making decisions and hiding behind the coach and the GM like the Haslam's have done with the Deshaun Watson thing. Gets back to your point from earlier. If the Jets had benched Aaron Rodgers, Woody would have been, well, I'm, I don't make football decisions. And they've never been candid with who really was the one. Who was the one? Who was the prime mover? Who was the impetus for this Deshaun Watson debacle with the $230 million fully guaranteed over five years, and you give up three first-round picks and three other draft picks. You gut the nucleus of your young, developing, emerging team for five years to come by giving up those draft picks. So they've never been candid that it goes to ownership, but it does. And you're right. That would have been a much bigger deal than it has been. And I didn't know what to expect for the Browns coming into the season because last year, without Deshaun Watson, they got to the playoffs. Joe Flacco looked good, so good they couldn't bring him back this year because they would have been chanting for Flacco week one against the Cowboys if Flacco had been on the sideline that day. But they do have a guy. Now, I think we've talked about this recently again. It's the the small cereal box variety pack, and I can't remember – who I said this to, but the coach of the year thing, I think we did the coach of the year draft last week, right? We did. Coach of the year isn't best coach of the year. It's the, it's the biggest surprise of the year. Kevin Stefanski has won the biggest surprise of the year twice. It's weird to think that the defending biggest surprise coach of the year is embattled, but he is, he is, they are. I don't know what, the Haslam's are going to do after the season. I don't know if they're going to keep Kevin Stefanski. I don't know who they're going to blame for this mess, but we know that bad owners don't blame themselves. Yeah. All right. He should be embattled. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just surprised by the, the, the conversation. 
Yes, of course you're, you're of course you're on the hot seat because you are, it's not just the two and eight thing. That's that's not it. It is two and eight. You had Deshaun Watson uh, in place for many weeks. You kept saying he gave you the best shot to win. He didn't. You knew he didn't, but you kept saying it anyway. And beyond that, it's your association with Deshaun Watson. The day they made that trade, I said, okay, it's a package deal. If if Stefanski is out, I don't think, how does Andrew Barry stay? And I'm not calling for anybody's job. I'm just saying, just looking at it, just to be fair, they, didn't they all come together and say, this is the best move for the team? Did Stefanski resist it? Did he say, I don't want this guy. We can do better. I don't want Deshaun Watson. I don't want to give up all that. I can, hey, I'm, I'm an offensive guy. I can work with anybody. Or was he on board with Barry? Uh, because I, I think if, if, if you take out Stefanski, you got, it's a package deal. They all were on board for uh, Deshaun Watson. You're right. It should be everybody, including Haslam, but it's his team. So he's not going anywhere. The Haslams won't go anywhere. But the guys who said, yeah, we're fully on board and we're going to give him a guaranteed contract and trade him. We're going we're gonna to trade. We're going to make a trade with a team in our conference, a team that is much better than we are right now, a team that beat us in the playoffs last year, embarrassed us in the playoffs. And they're going back to the playoffs this year. So they got a brighter future than we do. Uh, I, I just feel like anybody who said yes to Deshaun Watson or it, anyone who didn't protest probably has to go. Well, and that's a great point you make. I take us back to November 6th. Andrew Barry, GM of the team, was doing a bi-week press conference. And Mary Kay Cabot of Cleveland.com asked this question to Andrew Barry. GM of the team. Was the decision to trade for Deshaun Watson yours, or was it your idea, or was this mandate from above? Answer. Like we've always said, all of us were on board. Everyone's on board, and obviously with a big commitment in that regard, that's always going to be the case. So, okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Everybody except ownership. Bye-bye. Including including Paul De Podesta. Remember they made that big deal when the baseball guy's coming to work in football and it's all going to be analytics driven and he's the chief strategy officer. I just wonder if he's just like the last line of defense for the Haslams. That that if they ever fire him, like he's the last one to provide cover for their decisions. Is I I I'm starting to think that's what that is. You know, the head coach First line of defense, providing cover for the bad decisions of ownership. GM, second line of defense, providing cover for the bad decisions of ownership. And we even have something nobody else has, a chief strategy officer. Don't blame us. Don't blame ownership. We've got a chief strategy officer. Blame him. Blame him. It really is amazing. And it's sad. It's sad. It's the haunted house. If you're a fan of the Browns, and I've got family members who are fans of the Browns, and you can't just... Stop being a fan of a team that you've been loyal to your right. whole life. It gets ingrained in who you are. Right. It's like family. Yep. You can't turn your back on, on family. Well, uh, there's a, another rabbit hole to go down there. But you can't. Most people can't. It's who you are. And you're stuck. As Jed York said, when the 49ers were mired in dysfunction seven years ago before they hired Kyle Shanahan, you don't dismiss the CEO. Not of a football team, you don't. And that's a problem. And that's why every once in a while, like people are like, oh, what's going to happen with private equity? Maybe maybe these private equity firms are going to start putting the screws to some of these bad owners and working, especially if you have one of these private equity firms that can own 10 percent of up to 12 different teams. There's just one conglomerate of private equity companies that are permitted in theory to own 10 percent of up to 12 teams. Once you have a group with that kind of juice, they start banging on the commissioner's door about the owner of this team that is that has no idea what he or she is doing, maybe that's the way to start pushing some of these bad owners out of the league for good. Because you otherwise, you just have to wait for them to sell the team or die. Right, yeah. Otherwise, you're stuck. And, and you mentioned Paul DePodesta. Mike, I'm going to tell you the best job in football. Good work if you can get it. It is 
if, whether it's chief strategy officer, whether they call him that, or team president. So team president who doesn't have uh, a weekly, week, doesn't give weekly press conferences, not like Jerry Jones, doesn't go on the radio, doesn't have a radio deal, but you usually see the owner in the owner's suite, and then right next to him, there's someone smiling right next to the owner, patting him on the back, high-fiving on touchdowns. Those team presidents, those chief strategy officers, you're not really sure what they do, but they're always around ownership, and who knows what they're whispering into their ear, and so when the general manager is not doing a good job, the team president says, oh, I think we got to, hey, hey, boss, I think we got to move on from the general manager. Hey, boss, coach is not getting it done. Uh, we can get somebody else. Oh, no, hey, it's not your fault, boss. You're doing a great job. You're, doing, you're a great owner. Hey, hey, listen, anybody in the league would love working for you. And so you, you get a job like that, you can skate for a generation, 20, 25 years, because it's not really on you, and you've got the ear of ownership. And so I think... I don't know what Paul D. Podesta's uh, role is in Cleveland, and that's kind of the point. That's kind of the point. He does. That's how you survive. Well, and you think back over the course of his time there. This it was because it was the early days of the NFL leaning heavily into analytics, and the Browns were going to be all about analytics, and it hasn't worked. What has he delivered? It hasn't worked. But he's a buffer. For ownership, because at the end of the day, I think ownership wants other people who get the blame because don't blame us. And I think, look, that's why I respect Jerry Jones. He makes no bones about it. I'm the general manager of the team. Plenty of other owners are the de facto general manager of the team, but they're never going to be the ones to take the heat when the decisions that originate with the owner, like maybe we should bench Aaron Rodgers, go sideways. So... That's where it is, and that's why Stefanski's on the hot seat. Here he is from yesterday being asked the very simple question about the possibility that he is on the hot seat entering the final weeks of the season. So you know how this game goes. You grew, you grew up listening to WIP. <laughs> 610 uh, WIP. You're 2-8. and eight. Your name's shown up on hot seat lists mm-hmm. in the media. How, how do you feel going into this rest drop, yeah. stretch, Pittsburgh, Denver, Pittsburgh? Uh, I think probably because I grew up listening – to that, I'm smart enough to not worry about outside noise. Uh, I get that's part of this gig. That's life in the big city. Uh, my sole focus is getting this team ready to get a win on Thursday night. That's it. Here's the reality, though, and we hear it all the time. We don't listen to outside noise. We don't listen to outside noise. Maybe you should listen to outside noise because you know who does <laughs> listen to outside noise? I'll tell you who does. The person who it. signs your check. That's who listens to outside noise. That's one of the problems with the Jets. And that was a point that Aaron Rodgers made last week on McAfee as well before he got into the final point that ownership is the issue with some of these teams. They do. They do. They listen to the outside voices. It's one of the weird things about football that you and I, Michael, and everyone else in the media has a voice because we never know who the owner is going to listen to. And I know, and this surprises people, but and it surprised me at first, I've I've heard from team presidents who have said, you know, you go into the room at the league meeting and they're all reading PFT. It's one of the reasons why the league office has problems with me, because it's not because they philosophically disagree with me. It's because I make their life harder because owners read something I write that's critical of something the league is doing. Now they got to deal with that because the owner calls up and says, hey, what about this? Another owner, hey, what about that? So I'm creating little brush fires they got to put out because the owners are reading the stupid shit that I have to say. So they do. They listen to external voices. So this is my open plea to all coaches, especially coaches. I mean, players do what you got to do because there are too many external voices that could drive players crazy. If you're a coach and you don't have a finger on the pulse of what people are saying about your team, you're just asking for it. You need to know because the guy you're working for knows what's being said. If you don't, you're not properly equipped to survive in that profession. You quoted uh, Jerry Seinfeld earlier. I'm going to quote Ron Burgundy. Uh, to Kevin Stefanski, I don't believe you. <laughs> I, don't believe you. I, don't. I just don't. I don't. There's just no way. It, the job of a head coach is to pay attention to everything. And because you have to know 
what, what your players might be hearing out there. And so it, you don't have to be engrossed in it. You don't have to be immersed in it. But you have to know what's happening uh, at any time. Okay, this is a, a pitfall for me. Okay, why isn't my message landing? Oh, the guys can be thinking about that. They can be talking to the trade deadline is coming up. I know a lot of guys. Oh, his guy's name is in the in the media. So I got to be on top of that. I should probably just pull him aside, have a great conversation and say, no, uh, we love you. You're not going to be traded. Or this is what they're saying. This is why this is what PR people do. Media relations. Hey, coach, uh, you know, th th they're going to ask you about these three or four things. Just be prepared to answer this. Your sole focus cannot be on just the game. Your assistant, the position coach, maybe, uh, a coordinator, maybe, but the head coach has too much to worry about. It is a multitasking job. You can't just focus on one thing or you're not a good head coach. So he's listening to it and he knows. And, and also, you know what it does? It, it probably doesn't make you a, a, the, the best um, citizen who to just focus on your job when yeah, everything could change. Is he married? Does he have kids? You better be paying attention to what they're saying. It could affect your life, could affect the life of everybody around you. Of course, you got you to gotta listen to that stuff. Well, and I'll give you a very quick example that's somewhat related. We've got these questions still swirling about Doug Peterson's future in Jacksonville, and there's been nothing from the team. There's been no leak to maybe NFL media, which lit the fuse on – the whole house might explode after a loss to the Lions and they suffer the worst loss in franchise history. We, we've been three days in now with crickets. You've got to understand what people are saying and you got to figure out what a strategy is for dealing with it. And if you're not going to fire him, you probably should let people know you're not going to fire him and keep moving so people will quit speculating on the possibility of the guy being fired. All right, let's go ahead and take a break. When we return, this week's... Freshly minted, carefully calculated, and always accurate PFT Power Rankings on PFT Live, presented by Accenture. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.